Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello, everybody. I heard Ernie yesterday, and he said, hi, family. And that was so nice, you know, because then I feel that we are all in this together. Um... I'm Margarita, I'm a recovered alcoholic today, and it's truly by the grace of God and these 12 steps and good sponsorship that I'm standing here today. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit what I was like, what happened, and uh, how it's like today. And how I finally found the solution for my alcoholism after 40 years of drinking. Um, um, I'm, uh, I'm a twin. Um, my family had no alcoholic problem, no one. Um, it was middle class. It was, I had a good upgrowing. There was nothing wrong with that. Um, the only thing I've been thinking about is my twin sister, she's not an alcoholic, she's never had a problem with, with alcohol, she was, she could drink or leave it alone. Alcohol didn't exist like a problem for her at all, at all. But what I noticed was that um, when I talked to her later, she was talking about uh, our youth and she asked me, Don't you remember when we did that and that and we were playing theater and we did this and that? And I just, uh, no. And that that girl was there and her name was this. And and I, no, I don't remember. I don't remember. And we have a joke about that. You know, ISM. Incredibly short memory. I just wasn't there. I wasn't there. I, I don't remember. I was already in my bubble. It was, I was self-centered as a child. It was sort of, I was in my bubble. And um, at 14 years old, I took my first drink. And I remember it very well. We were at, um, I was visiting some friends, and they, I remember the bottle. It was white wine, and uh, I drank that wine, and it just, it was just magic what happened to me. You know, I had this spiritual experience. I had an internal shift. And as it says in the nine step promises, my outlook and attitude to the whole world changed. Everything changed. All my fears disappeared. I just woke up. I woke up from that bubble I've I've been in. You know, I had a spiritual awakening and it was magic. And the only thing I could think about, I got drunk, of course, the first time I got drunk, but the the only thing I could think about was, when can I do this again? And my brain can only remember success. success. And my, my brain immediately recorded that success. And, and I was, after that, I was thinking about, when can I do this the next time? When can I feel like that the next time? And my life changed there. Because nothing was ever good enough anymore without it. You know, I, I was thinking about it. I was longing for it. I was longing to have that feeling of freedom that I got. I could talk to anyone, I could talk any language, I could flirt with the guys, I was beautiful, and you know, you know what I talk about. That was what was happening 
when I drank alcohol. That was what alcohol did for for me. That I had a spiritual experience. It was magic. So I knew that I just had to drink alcohol to feel that way. And I did. I did. Every time I had an opportunity, I drank. The thing is that I felt good for a while, but I always got drunk. Always. So I had, I was genetically wired like that. I had the allergy from the beginning, from my first drink, like Peter said. I, 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 was, I, I was an alcoholic. I, I just didn't know that alcohol was my solution. Alcohol wasn't my problem. It was my solution when it worked for me. And I drank, and I drank, and I drank for 20 years. When we finished school, uh, my twin sister, she, uh, we both went to Stockholm. We moved to Stockholm. She got a job at a, at a telephone center and started to support herself. I went to Stockholm and I met a disc jockey from England who was uh, an amphetamist. And I, I, I was together with him, because that was exciting, and that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to party, I wanted to have fun, I wanted to feel like that all the time. And I was partying all the time, and I also used outside stuff. But like Peter said, my drug of no choice was alcohol. I always went back to alcohol. And when I took other stuff, I could drink more alcohol. And I was drinking like a mad dog for 20 years. For 20 years. And I got into relationships, out of relationships. Uh, I, had a, I had gave birth to a daughter during this time. I, alcohol was my master. It took me everywhere that I could have never done on my own power. Alcohol was my power. Alcohol made it possible for me to do crazy things that I never could have done on my own. And that's what, also if you, if you look at the nine step promises, you know, it says that God did for me what I couldn't do for myself. At that time, alcohol did for me what I could never, never do for myself. But from that, when I started to drink, I started immediately to live on self-will. It was all about what I wanted, what I needed, what I thought that I needed to be okay. And I was like a tornado running through the lives of others. I really was. I was changing partners. I was, if something wasn't good enough, I just dumped it. Next, next, next. I, I, it's not good enough here, I move there. And I nearly didn't work in this time. I didn't do, I was really, really messed up. In 1979, I um, came up to the countryside where my parents lived because I had nowhere else to go. And I came from an abusive uh, relationship, which I had put myself in because I had made a selfish decision that that was good for me at the moment. And I put myself in that. But anyway, I came up to my parents' place with my daughter in, my, in one of the hands and the plastic bag in the other. And I came up to them because I, I had nowhere else to go. And um, I got restless, irritable, and discontent. I couldn't stay with them. So I met um, a guy who was an alcoholic because he drank like me. And that was that suited me fine. And but when I was up there, I think it saved my life because I had to. I knew a lot of people there 
because this house, we, we've been there when we were children and I knew a lot of people and I, I just had to try and control it. So that's when I tried, started to try to control my drinking. I really did try, but I did not succeed. We were drinking together and he was drinking worse than me, I thought. So I drank behind him, but I was just as bad. And um, we were together for 10 years and then I decided, no, uh, he's not good enough for me, he's drinking too much. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, we separated and I uh, lived on my own and I started to drink uh, alone at home because I thought if I can be alone, I can drink like I want to drink. Just as I, I can, you know, fill the bathtub up and have these glasses of wine, this illusion, you know, that I can, I can control it and I can enjoy it. But it never worked. It never worked. The, the result was that I, I got very isolated. Because I knew that I couldn't go out and drink because I lost control all the time. All the time. I knew. Um, so I, I, I was isolated, but I had some friends that was also drinking, of course, and one of them asked me if I wanted to go to Norway for a three-day ride, uh, go up in the mountains and, uh, you know, to a hotel up in the mountains, and I said, no, no, I don't want to go. Fear, because I knew there was going to be drinking. And when I was at home, I thought I could control it. I thought I could, I'm just drinking, uh, I'm just going to drink three. And then I, I drank more. But I, as I went to bed and I woke up and I thought, oh, nothing happened. I was alone. So it was okay. But I didn't dare to go out. But this time I went and it was like always. I started to drink, and I had drinks with me, and I got so drunk, and I don't remember anything of those three days. And I, I, on the way home, I bought more liquor, and I couldn't stop drinking. I couldn't stop drinking. And that was the first time I um, asked for help. And I went to my first treatment center. And um, I was devastated when I went there. But it was, it was magic for me to come there because I thought I was the only one in the whole world who had this problem. And I noticed that I came together with other people with the same problem as me and my ego rebuilt and I started to listen to their stories and they'd been robbing uh, shops and, you know, uh, and I thought, oh, poor people, I'm not like that. I'm not like that. So I took care of them a bit. And they told me there that um, I have, you cannot drink. Alcohol is your problem. So I thought, okay, I go home now because I feel okay, so I don't drink anymore. And I was also introduced to AA the first time there. I've never been to AA. I had no idea what AA was. And I was introduced to AA and I came to these meetings and they were talking about their feelings and and about their day. And in the beginning I thought that was great. You know, because it was all new for me. It was all new for me and I didn't know anything else. Anyway, um, I was nine years out and in of Alcoholics Anonymous in this contemporary AA. And I didn't get better when I stopped drinking. I got worse. And I didn't know what was wrong with me. I sat on, in those meetings and, you know, <sighs> fearful, anxious, self-conscious, self-centered, and they all seemed so happy, some of them. And I, I, I just thought, what's wrong with me? And I went out drinking again. And I went back to AA. 
and I went out drinking again. And then um, I decided to uh, go abroad because I thought that would help if I make a trip or don't make a trip, I make a trip. So I went abroad and I went to India. And I will also mention that I had started to take um, uh, tranquilizers, sedatives, uh, volume, what you call them. I took tablets. I took anything that could change the way that I felt. And I went to India and I had a nice time there. It, it was okay. It was okay. I was uh, taking tablets, but I didn't drink that much. And I went back again uh, to Sweden. I drank. I drank all the time, and I w but I had a new goal. I'm, I'm going back to India again. So I was there three times. And I thought I was quite okay, because I could control it, because I was abroad, and I was... I, I was feeling okay. But then I was invited to a family for a dinner. And, and um, they asked me what I wanted to drink. And I said, uh, oh, do you have water or something? Because they didn't know that I was drinking. And um, they said, no, we don't have any water, water, but we have a beer. And I said, okay, I'll take that beer. Suddenly, suddenly, I took that beer, and, and I was drunk for one and a half years. One and a half years from that beer. I went directly down to the bar, and I got so drunk. And I spent three months there. I was drinking every day from morning till night. I didn't find my, my way home. I, was, I wasn't eating. It was horrible, horrible for three months. And um, um, I got a call from home because my, my children couldn't get hold of me. The, my family didn't know where I was. And uh, I got a call from home that I had to come home because my mother had died. So I, I got help to come home because I couldn't. I couldn't uh, take myself home on my own. So I came home, and uh, the funeral was the next day. And I was full of pills, but I didn't drink. And I went uh, into the garden where all, all my whole family was, and my daughter was there. And um, she was so, she told me later, she was so angry with me. She was so angry with me. She didn't even know if I was dead or alive or anything because, you know, it was all about me, all about me. And she said, but when she saw me, she was thinking to herself, my mother is dying. And she took me aside because I was wobbling around the garden. I, w I was totally wacko. And she took me aside and she took my hand. She looked me in the eye and I looked her in the eyes and something happened. Her eyes were filled with tears, big blue eyes, very beautiful eyes. I just hadn't seen them, you know. And she looked me in the eyes and she said, Mommy, you have to do something because you are dying. And I only have you, she said, because her father is gone and I hadn't cared about her or anything. And something just happened. And I know today that it was God's grace who came into me. I, I had that moment of clarity. I think it was maybe two minutes. But I saw my life like, like this. And I saw that it was me. I saw what I had done to the people who loved me the most. My family who had cared so much for me. I saw, I saw it all. And I just collapsed. It was like time collapsed for me. It was this um, absolute defeat. And I just knew that I cannot take another drink. 
I cannot take another pill. And that was it. It was just two minutes. And uh, I, I just... I had nowhere to live, so I stayed with a friend, and I was uh, detoxing from pills. I'd been taking pills for, you know, over, I think 10, 12 years. And I don't advise anyone to do what I did, but I just knew that I cannot take one more pill or one more drink. I just knew in here that I can't. And that I suffered the next three months and I was down on my knees like Peter said and I said God help me help me and I think help me means thy will be done because it means that I cannot help myself you know and I prayed to a God that I didn't understand but it was like, you know, when, when, uh, when you go to the electric chair, when you know that there is no human power that can help you anymore, because I had tried everything. I had tried everything. Who do you call for? Or when you sit on a plane and the, you know the plane is going to crash. Who do you call for? You call for God. Whoever you think that is. Because I knew that my children couldn't save me. My family couldn't save me. No AA meeting could save me anymore. You know, I prayed to God to help me. And I couldn't, I couldn't eat. I couldn't talk, I couldn't walk, and I just prayed for God to help me to eat the banana. Help me, God, to eat the banana. Help me to take me to the shower. Help me, you know, for every, anything. And I, I went to my final third treatment center. The treatment never made me sober, but this time I had no choice. I had no choice. So I went to my last treatment center, and I was a wreck. I was a wreck. But this time of suffering, I am so grateful for that time of suffering, because my ego couldn't rebuild itself, because I was detoxing from these tablets. That was awful, so it kept my ego down. You know, and I went to this um, last treatment center, and I found this book, and I read a vision for you, and I knew that this is me, and I have to find these people in some way. But I didn't know how, and I came came back home, and I went went to aftercare. And I can see today how after my, my surrender, I was led to the right people. That God led me right in Sweden, where nobody was using the big book at all. On my meetings where I was, it was they read out of 12 and 12, and then they talked about dogs and cats. You know? That was how it was. Nobody talked about the big book. Anyway, I came to the aftercare. The guy there, I was devastated. I said, please help me. What, what do I do? You know, I know that I will drink again. It's not a matter about if I'm going to drink. It's when will I pick up that drink again. But because who can stand to feel the way that I did? You know? So... This aftercare guy, he just looked at me, I said, just help me, help me, what do I do? And he gave me uh, Gresham's Law. And I read that, you know, strong AA, medium AA, <laughs> strong coffee, medium coffee, and I understood again, this is what I have to have, this is what I have to have. After that, I was sent to a seminar. 
there were some guys from another town, and that guy had been sponsored by a guy who had been sponsored by Joe McQueen. <laughs> it's just, just and uh, I went to that seminar and they went through the steps and I was sitting there and people said well this was a nice course and oh it's nice to learn about this and I just said this is not a course for me this is about life and death for me I know that is I have to do this or I will drink and I will die and they just looked at me with that crazy girl. But I was really, really, I knew, I knew. And after that, I, I went to my AM meetings because I had nowhere else to go. And then suddenly it was one man there who had done the step. And he saw that I was desperate for help. And he said, you have to do the step. You have to do the step. And he took me to detox to t tell my story. Uh, this, this is just incredible what happened to me. You know, all the stuff that happened to me. And then um, he was always sharing about the steps for me at the meeting. And he took me to detox and he said, you have to do the steps. But I said, I have to have help. And I, I'd asked for sponsors, and they had t taken me to co for coffee, and they told me about uh, their miserable life. <laughs> you know? I didn't know what a sponsor was. But there was another guy in the meetings. And uh, we were sitting together, dying inside the rooms of AA. And this guy... His name is Joram, and he is a member of my group today. We have a small group called the Big Book Group in Borlänge. And bless you, Joram, if you ever hear this. He had, had met another guy who had done the steps, and they had just started a new group. And he was on fire with this, because he'd been in AA, and he, he was dying inside the rooms of AA. And they started a new group, and he said to me, Margarita, come, come to our group. And I went there, and we were just, I think, six people. And he helped me through the steps, and I was ready. I had already taken one, two, and three. But I didn't know what was wrong with me until... Uh, they explained to me from this big book that I had an allergy to alcohol and I had an obsession of, of, in my mind. I had this strange mental blank spot that I had no defense against the first drink, that I was powerless over alcohol and that my problem centers in my mind and that I have no choice. And I knew that. But it explained to me. The energy explained why I got drunk every time. The obsession explained why I couldn't leave it alone. Even though I promised myself millions of times, crying, <laughs> meaning it, that I will, if I just make it this time, I will never drink again. I promised my family, I promised my children, I promised everyone never to drink again. And my family said, why are you drinking, Margarita, when you know what's happening every time? I don't know. I was just going to have a few to take the edge off. And they asked me when I tried to not drink. But you're not drinking now. Why aren't you feeling good? <laughs> I don't know. I'm feeling miserable. You know? I didn't understand my problem. My problem was I didn't understand my problem. I did understand my problem from this book, from the first step, that I am powerless over alcohol. I have lost the power of choice forever because at certain times I don't have the mental effective defense against the first drink because otherwise what am I doing here? If I could choose not to drink I would be at home 
choosing not to drink and do other stuff. I am, I, I'm not cured about, uh, from alcoholism. I did these steps, and I think, you know, the last three steps, I did all the steps, I did my amends, I had a spiritual awakening, and it has to be better than the one I got from alcohol when it worked for me. It has to be better, because otherwise I will go back. And this program is so much more than just not drinking, you know. This is so much more. I've lost the power of choice, and I knew that. I knew that. And this little group got me into helping others at once. I was just newly sober, you know, and I, I lived in a small apartment in Borlänge, and they took people there because it was convenient because I lived there alone. So they took people there, and I was there, and we were doing fifth steps, and we were helping others, and I was just new, and it saved my life. It saved my life. I, I, I just lit up, you know, this is the juice. To be able to give this away, and so important to do it very early on. It says in the book, nothing will help you more than, than to go out and help others in, in the beginning of your sobriety, because it's like this. Yeah? So I, I am so fortunate to have found this solution in this book. And um, I knew I, I got another sponsor, and that was because I was into it. You know, uh, my recovery comes first and above everything else. And I was uh, going on Skype meetings, and I was on cliffs in Texas, Dallas, and, um, and there was a woman from Denmark who was sponsored by him, so I asked her to sponsor me. And she took me through the big book, boom, 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 like that. And I needed that because, so that I could carry the message from the book exactly as it's outlined here. And she took me, I think it took three weeks over Skype. And I had another spiritual awakening, and I have spiritual awakenings all the time, because this is never ending. This is a, a journey, you know, and I've just started a journey, and, and it's a beautiful journey. But I have recovered. The mental obsession is gone, because I had to find another solution than alcohol. And that solution must be better than what, when alcohol works for me. And I have found that solution in this book. And I've had a spiritual experience. And I'm trying to carry this message to as many people as I can. Everyone that God puts in my life, I am responsible. Not the one beside me. Not that one or that one or you. I am responsible. And I never forget that guy in the meeting who had taken the steps and talked about the steps. The only one who did that. He was sitting there for me. And I know that God led me to all these people so that I could find this program, so that I could recover and not die in this disease. And I mean, God is doing amazing things for me today. And we're here in California. I came from cold Sweden, and this wasn't my plan. I mean, seven years ago, I couldn't go to the mailbox. <laughs> and I'm standing here today. I was scared to death. What if I meet a neighbor? I don't know what to say. I, w I didn't want to see anyone. I didn't know how people could live. I was, I remember I was standing in my, my, my window looking at people going with the, these sticks and dogs and being happy. And I was standing in there just miserable and I wondered, how do they do that? 
How can they be happy just going out with a dog or stick and, be, and just talking crap? How do they do that? <laughs> so I, I went to my solution. The only solution that I knew, you know, alcoholism. I mean, I didn't know that I was suffering from a deadly, progressive illness. I didn't know that. I thought that I was okay if I didn't drink. And that's the big lie, that I think I'm okay if I don't drink. I have to do something about this condition because I was worse sober than drunk. I didn't know how to live. This book has learned me how to live one day at a time. Because I had to find a power that was greater than me. And I have found that power by which I can live one day at a time. And it's my responsibility to keep in fit spiritual condition. God doesn't do for me what I can do for myself. He loves me, but he doesn't come uninvited. I have the responsibility to keep myself in fit spiritual condition, to access this power every day. And it says here, it's easy to, yeah, rest on your laurels. I have one day, one day's reprieve. Yeah, that's what it says. And that's my responsibility. And I live in this step. And I live in this book. And I know there is no other way for me. Because I tried it. I try to live in the three dimensions of life. Work, you know, live like other people. Doesn't work for me. I had to be catapulted into the fourth dimension for me to be able to exist in this world as the alcoholic that I am. And I am so grateful. I am so grateful that for everyone who is carrying this book to show that there is a solution. There is a solution. And I mean, I think God got tired of seeing people like us die. And he, he sent, he put some people together so that this book could be written for me and for you so that we don't have to die in the gutter. Because that's where I would have ended up. And I am so grateful to be here. And uh, and Angie and Jeff, they have left their whole house up for us and the hospitality. And uh, it's just amazing what God can do. If I do what I what I'm supposed to do, because I know why I'm here today. I know why I am alive. It is to carry this message to people who were like me, who is like me. And there is no hopeless case if you really want this. It's for everyone. I think I stopped there. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you all. And excuse me for my bad English. <laughs> I wish I could have done it in Swedish, but <laughs> you have to come to Sweden. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Peter Nissen. I am a recovered alcoholic. <laughs> and if you thought you were going to see Peter I'm really sorry. <laughs> We come from, he comes from New Jersey, I come from Old Jersey. Old Jersey is a little island uh, just off the coast of France that still belongs to, still belongs to England somehow.
we're not quite sure how but, but the, all the law is in French and it's all kind of very strange and very crazy but it was once, de- once described as 70,000 alcoholics clinging to a rock in the middle of the English Channel <laughs> <coughs> I was one of those alcoholics clinging to that rock uh, I got sober in Jersey on December the 11th 1981 uh, I have, with the grace of God, and steps in this book, I've got 31 years of sobriety. Uh, I think, uh, without, without sort of pressing it very far, that's pretty much permanent sobriety. Um, though I've got to tell you, and it, you, it, later on you'll see that it very nearly wasn't. Um, I'm going to tell you what happened, what it was like, what happened, what it's like now. Um, my drinking story is going to be very short. I started drinking when I was 14. I was awkward. I was a very strange teen. I'm tall. I got tall really quick. I got tall quicker than I grew that way. Okay, so I was very strange. I walked strange. They used to call me the India rubber man. um, Because I was kind of like Link. It's kind of awkward. We all say we didn't fit in. Uh, You'll find out tomorrow if you come to the workshop why I didn't fit in. Um, you know, there's some of us who say we have a spiritual malady. The big book doesn't say that. The big book doesn't say that that's what's wrong with me. What's wrong with me is selfishness, self centeredness. That's why I was awkward. Because everybody, I thought everybody's looking at me. That's why I was awkward. That's why I was shy. Because I thought everybody's looking at me. And they weren't, you know. But that's another story. One night I went out with. Um, the, the son of the landlord of a pub that my grandfather used to, used to drink in. And um, he was several years older than me. I was 14, he must have been 17. He was driving a car. And he had some older friends as well and we ended up on a bit of a pub call. We ended up and I discovered very early on something, something called, called snake bite, which was brandy and cider. So, and the cider we're talking about is not American cider. This is English cider, which is more alcoholic than wine. Okay, so it's about 12%, 12-14% with a shot of brandy in it. Uh, that, and I took a drink of that and I went... <sighs> and now I could run with these guys, I could go talk to the girls, I could go and do, do discos. It was the 70s, it was the 60s, early 60s. I could go do discos. I turned from being a very shy, goofy kid into one of the in crowd. I was a mod. But then I had a motorcycle, so I wasn't quite... I was a mocker, which is halfway between a mod and a rocker. (laughs) And And a rocker, they had leather jackets and sideburns and slick back hair and stuff and I had longer hair and it got longer and longer and longer and us mods turned into hippies Uh, that's what happened in the UK I don't know what happened here but this is what happened with us Uh, I was also a surfer so I was really I was into all sorts of stuff but alcohol was my buddy all the way through my teen years from the time I was 14 to the time that I kind of left home and for some reason or other went to sea I was supposed to go to art school but I ended up going to sea I think that kind of might have saved my life there was a lot of stuff going on in art school in the 1960s including revolution and a whole bunch of drugs so maybe that saved my life but if you drank the way that I drank you needed several things you need, first of all you needed money to buy the alcohol you needed someone to give you food and you needed somewhere to go to sleep and if you're on a ship you get all three plus on the ships I was on which were going foreign we also had bonded stores and once you got outside of the 12 mile limit you could buy whiskey at about a third of the price that you would pay for it ashore I love that there was always a a bottle of spirits and a case of beer in my cabin always I used to drink to go drinking (laughs) <laughs> when we got to when we get someplace we'd go ashore the ship would come up alongside we'd be getting ready to go ashore I would have a bottle of rum or a bottle of whiskey open and I'd have several shots of that so I could go ashore and go drink and I was drinking to go drinking and there was nothing wrong with my drinking 
I believe I was an alcoholic halfway. I was. I believe that I drank alcoholically halfway down my first drink because I got that sense of ease and comfort that came at once. Talks about it in the big book. Talks about a sense of ease and comfort that comes at once. Nothing else did it. Nothing else. And it's like I'd held my breath until the time I took that drink. And it was a spiritual awakening. It allowed me to do stuff that I couldn't do in cold blood. And it was my buddy for many years. I drank for 20 years. It's not that long, actually. I drank from the time I was 14 to the time I was 34. It got progressively worse. I spent time at sea with the idea of coming back to Jersey and being a sea pilot. Jersey's a very rocky place. We've got lots of rocks. And we've got this tide that disappears like three miles out there somewhere and all these rocks show up and the island at low water is about a third the size, a third the size bigger than it is at high water. And there's all these rocks. And one day I was on a ship and I'd been, I'd gone, we, we, technical reasons we had to travel with the ship. And the night before I'd been sitting down watching the TV on this French ship with all this wine about, and they'd gone to bed and I'd carried on drinking watching this TV and I took a bottle of bed with me and the next morning we get to Jersey and they call the pilot to bring the ship into the harbour. And I got up under the bridge and I'm three parts wrecked and I looked out the window and it was foggy. And I'm drunk and I'm looking in, I'm bringing the ship in on the radar. And I, it didn't look right. And I walked to the edge of the, the bridge and I looked down and there's this rock going past about two meters away. There's 600 passengers on this boat. There's I don't know how many cars were headed for the rocks. I missed it by that much. By the time I got in, someone had phoned ahead or whatever I was told I should shape up or ship out what did I decide to do? ship out because I couldn't stop drinking so I changed my job progressively worse I ended up sitting in my car one day with a bottle of vodka under the seat my surfboard in the back watching the guys go surfing and knowing that I couldn't do it anymore because I was now frightened of the water and I was too drunk to stand up anyway not that I stood up, I was knee boarder but that's one of those things, I was on my knees anyway but. and I just knew it, and it took away something that that I loved that I was really committed to and it took it away but it was okay because I could still drink I'd got married by this time That lasted until about two years after I got sober and we got divorced, which is not uncommon apparently. I made promises to my wife, I made promises to my parents, I made promises to the people I worked with. I ended up um, as a, a place where I could only employ me. And I ended up working for myself and I had a hole in the wall panel beaten business that did cheap respray. I'm a sea captain. But it was okay because I could keep on drinking. And in my, in, my, in my workshop, I was never more than about six feet away from alcohol. I had it hidden everywhere. It was everywhere. It was in my, it was in my, um, in my toolkit and whatever. And I, I spoke to somebody after I got to Alcoholics Anonymous who was in the same situation and I never thought of this but he had vodka in that thing that you put, you top up batteries with it's got that funny kind of spigot thing on the top just a bottle with this rubber spigot thing on the top for topping up batteries and he had vodka in there every now and again he did. I never thought of it I wasn't as creative as that I just had bottles everywhere they were just like stashed away and I had a buddy called Fred and my buddy called Fred used to come and see me and he used to bring a case of, Schlo of uh, Grolsch lager and we used to sit in the back of my back of my workshop with all these busted up old cars and motorcycles and stuff and we used to drink rock. And then he used to go away and he used to leave some cans there and he said, oh, we'll finish them next time I come round. And the next time he came round, they'd gone. And he said, where did, go? where did that go? It was only yesterday. I said, well, they're gone. 
So I have to get some more. What's really interesting about Fred is that Fred ran with me. He, talk, he, he drank with me. We drank at the same places. We hung out with the same people. We drank the same amount. And one day Fred met a young lady. And she said to him, I don't like you hanging out with that Peter Misson guy. He drinks too much. You come home too. You come home drunk. And if we're going to have this relationship, I don't want you to do that anymore. And he said, that's okay, my love. I'll have two and I'll come home. And what did Fred do? He had two and come home. He could pull it off. I used to say to my wife, I won't be late tonight, I'm just going to go down and I'm just going to have a couple. Maybe Wednesday I'd turn up home. <laughs> I knew I had to leave because my dinner was on the, it was like a promise, and I knew I had to leave, but it was like 7 o'clock in the evening and it was an awful long time from the time I went to bed at 11 o'clock and I need one more. And I'd have one more. And then it was, well you know, it's getting a bit late now anyway, so maybe one more wouldn't, wouldn't hurt because the dinner's going to be cold anyway. And then it gets to be 11 o'clock and I'm still thinking, uh, maybe I'll have to take a couple of bottles home. And so I'd have what we call a carry-out. And I'd take some bottles home with me and I'd come home drunk and there'd be a scene and all this kind of stuff. The last five years of my drinking were continuous. I was unemployable. Um, I'd done some other stuff. I'd gone out and tried to save the world as well. That was the other deal. That was possibly the arrogance of this thing. I was involved in Greenpeace and stuff. I was wrecked all the way through that. I had, by this time, I had beard down here somewhere. I had shoulder length hair. Um, I had all the deal. I was, I was a real hippie. It was, but I was drinking all the time. I was using, I was using other, other stuff. I was smoking a lot of dope and psychedelics, but I seemed to have control and choice over those. What I didn't have any choice and control over was alcohol. It was always there. It was always there somewhere. You know, do a couple of lines of coke, mm, a glass of wine would be really nice. <laughs> you know? And that glass of wine would be really nice usually turned out to be a very large bottle of wine. And I used to like that, uh, I can't remember what it was called, Lambrusco. You know, that a slightly little fizzy kind of thing. I like that, I like that sort of stuff. Love brandy. So like all that stuff. When I got to be 34 and two months or three months, I was uh, got to a place. Well, when I in in the last two years of my drinking, I had three three suicide attempts. The reason I had three suicide attempts was that I kept on promising the people I loved and that loved me that I wouldn't do it anymore, and I went and did it again. And I really desperately didn't want to do it, but I did it again. And I did it again, and I did it again, and I really meant it when I promised them. I wasn't lying. And I got to think that I was, I was some kind of, I was some kind of bad person. That actually, it would, they would all be better off if I wasn't there. And after three suicide attempts, the last one was the most successful, if you see what I mean. I got better at it. I was a practicing alcoholic and a practicing suicide. I never learned how to drink, but I was learning how to kill myself. <laughs> if you see what I mean. The last time it was a big pump out job and I was unconscious for a while and all that kind of stuff and they stuck me next to a guy who was dying of lung cancer. They do that with suicides, you know. They put you next to somebody that's really dying. And I discharged myself and just carried on drinking. And on the 10th night of the 10th of December... 1981 I'd been drunk for a long time maybe two weeks maybe three weeks but really drunk I mean I was drinking all the time but I was really I was knee walking drunk for maybe three weeks and I used to go down to the shop in the morning you know it's got nothing to do with alcohol you see I used to wake up in the morning and I'd be shaking and feeling awful and I'd go down to the to, there's a, there was a little little there was a little kind of apartment underneath where I lived that I let out to some guy that and they had an ele- there was an electric meter and the electric meter paid for the electric bill out of the rent and it was like my money but I would break into the electric meter and take some money out of the electric meter to go down to the shop and buy a bottle of cheap wine and I'd be shaking and I'd be rattling and I'd be walking down the hill to go and get this bottle of cheap wine and it was like French wine it's veiled in air and it's, it's got like a tall bottle with stars around the top and there's like a little metal cap that you pull off and there's a little plastic cap inside you flick off and that's the last time you see that 
transportation purposes only. You know, this is a drink. This is drinker's boots, and it's rough as hell. It takes the skin off your throat when you, when, but it hits the spot. And I, I get into the shop, and I, I just about get my money out, and I put it on the horse, and I pick up pick up the bottle, and I get out the, I get out the shop, and I'm starting to walk back up the hill to my house, and I got it under my arm, and I'm okay. I'm feeling okay. I got my buddy now. I haven't even drink yet. But I'm feeling okay. I've got that sense of ease and comfort because I've got my bottle. And I haven't had a drink yet. See, it's got nothing to do with booze. When I got home, I had that drink. <laughs> but I, I, I fast forward because there's lots of stuff that happened, but I mean, it's such a, it is a long time ago. And I don't think it's the most important part of what happens to me. It's happened to me. It's my drink. And we all know how to do that. We all know how to drink. That's what we're doing here. We, we, we know what it does when we drink. We're great at stopping drinking. Our problem is that we always start again. My, my drinking was almost continuous for the last, maybe the last five or six years. The only time I ever stopped for any length of time was for about three months, was to get that pilot's exam. To actually get that exam so that I could bring ships in and out of the harbour. And I, I, I failed it the first time because I was drunk. And the second time I said, I'm going to get this. I've done, it's taken me seven years to get here. I'm going to get this. And I stayed sober. And I said, until I get that exam, I'm not going to have any drinks. And I stayed sober three months on that. And I got the exam. And within five minutes of passing the exam, I had a drink in my hand. And then I continued to drink as I drank daily for the rest of the, rest of the time. And that was maybe another 10, 12 years. About halfway through that night on the 10th of uh, December something happened to me that night i had been attempting to do some stuff during the day and in the night I'm still drinking I'm drinking vodka and wine and all of a sudden I, I, can, I can picture it right now is that I'm sort of kind of standing swaying in the middle of this room and the floor went black the only way I can describe it, the floor went black. I ended up on my knees thinking that if I went into that darkness, I wasn't going to come back. And I ended up on my knees and I said, God, please help me. And I meant it. And then I had the idea to call Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I had no contact that I know about with Alcoholics Anonymous any time in my life before this. Alcoholics Anonymous had only been in Jersey for about seven years. I was born eight years after this book was published. It was published just in time, just for me. <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous was about seven years old in Jersey when I, when I, when I, in 1981. It had been there before, but it had disappeared. They kind of got some infighting going on and the whole thing had just gone. They'd all gone out and got drunk. <laughs> and it had been restarted by a bunch of Glaswegian builders and gangsters that had come to the island to work on the, uh, in the building these guys were hard people and I hated them because I had drunk with them and I hated them and I called Alcoholics Anonymous and I couldn't find Alcoholics Anonymous in the phone book couldn't spell alcoholic it's a funny word <laughs> the H's, the O's and the C's are all in the wrong place I don't smell good. It's one of the other things that I found out that I could do when I could drink. I didn't care whether I couldn't smell good. But what I, what I, who I found was a, an outfit called the Samaritans. And the Samaritans is an outfit that you can call when you're suicidal. And they kind of talk you down. And they're wonderful people. And they do this voluntarily and they're amazing. And I talked to them many times. Uh, and I found their number. I knew where their number was. And I called them and said, I've got a problem with alcohol. I need to talk to somebody in Alcoholics Anonymous. And they said, where are you? And I told them where they were. They said, stay there. Someone will call you in 10 minutes. And they found somebody from Alcoholics Anonymous. And he called me in 10 minutes and said, where are you? And I told him where you were. And they said, we'll be around in 20 minutes. I finished all the wine we had, we had in the house before they came. <laughs> By that time, I was passed out. He, there was, the two people who came were a guy called Noel, who was an Irish gangster from, from London, from a bad gangster family, 
bunch of Irish folks, really notorious where he come from, and a woman called Judith, and they are still sober today. They're still sober today. And they picked me up off the floor, and they said, stay there, someone is going to come to see you in the morning. And in the morning the bell went in the front door and I staggered over to the front door and I'm feeling nauseous and I'm feeling sick and I'm shaking like crazy. <laughs> and standing in front there was a little little Scotsman. I hated Scotsman at the time. <laughs> with a little cheroot. He said, my name's Billy, I'm an alcoholic, I hear you want to stop drinking. Well, I wasn't sure about that, but I knew I wanted help. And he had a, he had a blue book under his arm. Like that. And a little cheroot in his, cheroot in his, in his hand. And he came in and he sat me down and I sat down by the fire and I was cold and it was like December and he sat next to me smoking this little cheroot and this little cheroot got to me and I started throwing up <laughs> nothing to do with the alcohol of course and he commenced to tell me his story and he'd drunk in the same place as I'd drunk in he's had experience on being ships like I'd had he drank like me he started calling himself an alcoholic and I thought, well, I drink like that. So if you're an alcoholic, I must be an alcoholic. And he said, you know what's wrong with you? He said, you have an allergy to alcohol. And I didn't know anything else. Well, what are you talking about? He said, when you drink, your body wants more, more alcohol. So when you start drinking, he said, you can't stop drinking. And I said, that's why. That's why. And then he said, he said, the other thing, he said, the problem is that when you stop... You start to get thirsty. And you want, you want to start drinking again. I said, oh, that's why I can't stop. And he said, yeah. And he said, we got some steps. And it was amazing, you know. I, I could have been 12-step by somebody else that said, you didn't have to do that. All you had to do was go to meetings. We had the two types of there. And these guys, these guys, these guys, Asian guys, they, they, were, they were the hard men, if you like. Didn't really know what they were doing. I thought Billy had been sober for a long time. He'd only been sober about six months when he came to the 12 step me. He didn't really know what he was doing. But he had the, he had the instruction book, see? And he was following the instructions. And he taught me how to do the 12 steps. It took a long time. Not like we know how to do it now. It took me about 18 months, I guess, to get to, get to step 12. Something like that. A year and a half. I stayed sober. Went to a lot of meetings. What happened to me after that is I got, I got into the middle of AA and Billy gave me this. Not this particular card. This particular card is the second one I've had. The one Billy gave me, I, I, I gave away to one of my protégés. But this is only the second card I've ever had and it says on here that I am responsible. Billy gave me this after he'd given, after I'd done the third step. He said, I am responsible. And this is where anyone, anywhere reaches out for help. I want the hand of AA to be there, always be there. For that, I am responsible. Not you, me. And he said, there you go. Carry that with you. Remember that. And I remembered that until I was about about ten years so I've been involved in intergroup, I've been chair of intergroup, I've been treasurer of meetings, I've been a delegate to conference, I've been an alternate delegate to conference to start with. Do you know what that makes me? That makes me eligible to be a trustee of Alcoholics Anonymous. I did my three... I was offered that some days ago, some months ago in Europe, and I said, no, thanks. I don't want to get stuck in the middle of the service structure of Alcoholics Anonymous. I said I wouldn't be effective there. I'd be hamstrung. I want to be where I can be effective. Because I think this is important. About ten years sober, this is the most important thing that I did. This is the most important part of my story. About ten years sober, I started to see that I didn't actually have very much money. I started to see that I had a very small car. I started to see that I didn't really live in a very good place and that my wife had divorced me several years before and I didn't have a lady friend at the time and I became irritable, restless and discontent at 10 years sober and I had a plan 
Margaret will tell me, tell you, I've always got a plan. I, 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 got, I have a plan. I've always got a plan. And I had this plan. And this plan involved finding a rich woman <laughs> to marry, so I wouldn't have to work anymore, that had some kind of skill that we could probably both benefit from. Um, property was involved in there, and there was all sorts of other stuff. And uh, in order to do this, I did some. I began some research. And the way I did research is not like we do on the online now. It's, it's, I believe. I don't know. I mean, it seems to me there's a couple of my proteges are doing it, and I'm getting one of them's getting really goofy. But apparently now you can find these lonely hearts online. What I used to do was local newspapers, you know, box numbers in local. It was, and I I started to play out exactly the same way as I did when I was drinking but here I am 12, 14 years sober and I am promiscuous and I am, do, I am doing this deal with these lonely hearts things I've now changed my job I'm, I'm teaching sailing now so I'm involved lots of young folks around I'm 40 plus most of the other sailing instructors are in their 30s I'm the old guy not the oldest but I'm the old guy but I'm kind of playing out and I'm doing all these, all up and down the south coast of the UK, I'm doing these one night stands and I'm flirting and I'm, 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 te- I'm a terrible flirt. Or I was. I've stopped doing it now. With the grace of God, this is another thing that I learned. And I ended up half owning a restaurant. My wife was the chef. She was a very talented lady. Her father was very rich and generous. I was, in fact, the third owner. I wasn't a half owner, I was the third owner. He was the second, he was another third, and she was the third. We were married, and I had everything that I set out to get six years before. Everything. We had a big car, we had several cars. I had a big property, it was a very big property in a village in in the south coast of the UK. Uh, I was owner of a business that would have been very successful if if I'd have carried on with it. Um, I'd married money, the whole deal. And I was batshit crazy. And miserable as sin. I was dissatisfied. I was irritable. I was discontent. I was angry. I felt like I just like everything was closed to me. Somewhere or other I think I knew the way that I got there. One night I'm serving customers and there's a bottle of Barramundi always remember Australian red wine called Barramundi it's got, it had like a kind of really jazzy cover good cover, label I poured two glasses for the for the clients I'm walking out the prep room with these two bottles two, two, two glasses and my head says see look what you've done you're feeling like shit you might as well drink and my arms got longer and I set them down on the table and I walked through the prep room I walked through the kitchen my wife said to me, where are you going? I said, out and I I was propelled into the street and I didn't know what had happened I didn't see it coming I didn't see it coming page 24 of this book says a certain time it says that at a certain time I will be defenseless against the first drink it took me 16 years to get there. I didn't know what had happened. I got to a meeting two, three days later after locking myself up in a room and rocking and saying how I'm Mary's for two days. I'm a good Catholic boy. I hadn't prayed for years. I did all the stuff. You see, early on in my sobriety, I did all the stuff that this book asked me to do. But then I just got too busy. And then I started to want again. And I started to need again. And I started to, the ego started to regrow. You see, something I learned about this by studying this book, every time they say self in here, we can say ego. That's what we say today. When they wrote the book, they called it self. So if I'm, if I'm self-centered, we call it ego-centered, ego-centered now. They, they say it once in the book. Egocentric as they say it nowadays. 
But it was new then. We say it all the time now. It's very important when we see self. I see self in here. I see ego. So that's my problem. I don't suffer from a spiritual malady. I suffer from an oversized ego that wants more all the time and is never satisfied when it gets it. I got to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm sitting in the back and it's a it's contemporary AA. They're talking about the washing machine and the dog and the car breaking down. And, and I'm sitting in the back and I'm shaking and I'm crying. I'm, I'm, I don't know what's going on. And, it, and, and the meetings have changed. Over the years, the meetings have changed. Over those 15 years, the meetings have changed. When I first came into Alcoholics Anonymous, we were 12-stepping people. We were reading this big book. I was listening to tapes very, very early on from people who, who, who knew what they were talking about in AA. And I forgot it all. And I drifted away, and I drifted away, and I drifted away, and I drifted into me. And what I wanted and what I needed. I got back to this meeting, I'm sitting in the back of this meeting, I can remember it, I can remember it vividly. I am actually, I'm in bits. No one said a word to me. Nobody said hello, nobody said whatever, I just slunk in, I went in the back of the meeting, and I'm just sitting there going, well, I'm in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'd phoned a guy that I'd 12-stepped maybe 12 years before, I phoned him up and I said, I almost drank tonight, and he said, when was the last time you went to an AA meeting? And I said, I don't know, I can't remember, maybe six months ago, he said, you better get your ass there right now, and he put the phone down took me three days to get there Sunday night it was, Exeter UK, Sunday night meeting in Exeter, I went into there and they're all talking about this stuff the plumbing and the whatever and right at the end a guy called Trevor said, who was one of the meetings said, is anybody else in the room that got anything that, 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 that wants to share anything and I stood up and I said, I'm 16 years sober and I'm suicidal and I don't know what's going on and I want help. Thanks for sharing. Serenity prayer. I'm walking out the room and somebody came up to me and said, have you ever worked the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous? And I said, yes. He said, when? I said, about 15 years ago. And he said, what happened? I said, I felt I, I got sober. And he said, maybe you're trying to live on an experience you had 15 years ago now. Maybe you should try working the steps again. Come to our meeting in Crediton. We have a big book study meeting. And there's like four of them. And I went to Crediton and I started with in a a big book study. I didn't do anything for about six months. I ended up selling my house. I ended up being gifted with something. I had a detaching letter. The reason why, I've had two now, and I know why. You see, when I was drinking, and when I, got, I used to get angry, I used to bang my head on walls. Now, who gets, who gets detaching retinas? Boxers get detaching retinas. Because they've been hit on the head a lot. I've had two, one each side. The last one was, the last one was three years ago. This one was the right hand one. I had an operation and I had to, do, I, I, they filled my eye with gas and all this kind of stuff. And I had to lay down for about six weeks in a particular position so that the thing would heal. And I went back to Jersey. I was living in the UK and all over the place. I went back to Jersey. I went back to Jersey and I dragged out some tapes that I had little cassette tapes, the old fashioned cassette tapes and I had a little Sony a little Sony radio cassette player and I found a bu- bunch of Joe and Charlie tapes and I stuck those in and then talk, started talking about the big book so I thought I better find a big book and I'm lying down with one eye that eye, right and I'm reading the big book and listening to Joe and Charlie the old Joe and Charlie and I'd stop the tape when they told me to read something and I went and read it and I stopped the tape and they asked me to do something and I did it and they took me through the steps Joe and Charlie 16 years sober with one eye <laughs> and I had a spiritual experience I did a fifth step with a guy that I used to surf with a guy called Cliff he was my buddy we got curry every time I go back he wasn't really sure what I was doing 
Not really. I don't believe. But he was willing to hear it anyway. The fifth step, the six and seven, started to make my amends. My amends to my mother and my father, my ex-wife, my mother and my father were lifelong amends. I finished my amends with my mother and father when they died. I was with them. My hero is my dad. I held him in my arms as he died. My amends were over. He died beautifully. He was spiritual experience. He could never understand me. My dad one time in the Second World War was in the Navy and he was in Southampton during an air raid and what they used to do because they were macho sailor, sailor men was that they used to get a lock-in in a pub during, a, during a, an air raid they'd lock the doors nobody in, nobody out and drink <laughs> and sometime, sometime that night he went to a blackout and the next morning he woke up in the street lying in the street and he said if drinking that much ends up me not remembering what the hell I did and end up me lying in the gutter I am not going to do that again do you know what? never did it again <laughs> and I used to do that all the time so I never do that again I used to do it again and he said I couldn't understand he said I couldn't understand what was going on and I explained to him that I was able to explain to him eventually what was going on but having reworked these steps at 16 years sober I realised that what I had not been doing and what I had not been doing is, is the last three steps and particularly step 12 but also 10 and 11 I think the three are very 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 important I also had not been doing something because I heard something a long time ago by a very famous talk, speaker in, in, uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous that he did the first nine steps once and he lived in 10, 11, and 12. He didn't explain how you live in 10, 11, and 12, but you do the first... And I took that. I said, yeah, I've done the first nine steps. That's terrific. I'm living in 10, 11, and 12. I read them regularly out the 12 and 12. So I must be living them. You see? And we started to use the 12 and 12 on the big book while I was in those 10 years when I was get, headed towards my rich lady. You go, you go, you still go. And you, I got news too that contemporary AA in, in, in France and in, in England and in Jersey is alive and well. They're using that little yellow book. You know, little yellow book? Living Sober, I think it's called. Which I don't think we should ever publish. I don't know what the hell that's doing in Alcoholics Anonymous. It should be retitled The Things Not to Do to Stay Sober. Seriously. The 12 and 12, I've got, I've, I've got, I've got, I've got an observation about 12 and 12. If you look, at the, you look at the fourth step in this book, and you look at the fourth step in the 12 and 12, what the hell was Bill doing at 14 years sober? It wasn't this one. You look at the fourth step in the 12 and 12. It's not what's in here. What short memories we have. You see? Real alcoholics. I'm a real alcoholic. I'm different from other people. It tells me this in here. It says the idea that I'm like other people has to be smashed. That means that it cannot be repaired. You break a cup, you can, you can glue it back together. You smash a cup, no chance. Too many bits. Too small. So the idea that I was like other people, which took me to a place where I almost drank at 16 years sober because I thought I was like other people now because I wasn't drinking, was I? suddenly dawned on me after reworking the steps again that no, no, I'm different. I have to have a way of life that is different from other people, otherwise I am going to go back and drink again. A certain time will show up in my life. Again. And I don't ever want to be at that place where I am so far away from my last drink. Yet I am suicidal. Yet I am out of my head. Yet I am playing out. Yet I am doing all the stuff and living in self. It's horrible. It's bad, and I know I can't drink because I'm an alcoholic. But what else was I doing? I was doing some other stuff. 
I was getting that sense of ease and comfort by being promiscuous, by being a flirt. It's an amazing thing. It's a power thing. It's an amazing thing. And and I used to get off on all that sort of stuff. I was a bad person. (laughs) I was really bad. My amends to my mum is done. My amends to my first wife is done. My amends to my second wife is done. I've done all my amends. What was really interesting when I revisited the steps was I found out that I hadn't finished my amends. Guess where the amends were that I hadn't finished? Around relationships. Where was I playing out? Around relationships. That was interesting. I, I, I'm, I'm one of these frugal drunks. I didn't owe a lot of money. But I did owe some money to the government. And I paid all that off. What I try and do today is I try and live by what this book says. Somebody once said, you know, that the circle and triangle thing. But I used to be out, you maybe can't see it, but I don't have a really very big one, but I used to be out here living in the world and visiting. I uh, used to go to my AA meeting, go back out to the world. Go to my AA meeting, go back out to the world. Since I've reworked the steps, I've realized that I've got to be living in here and I've got to go visit the world. But I've got to come back and live in here. Because I'm different. I'm different. The reason, I, I, think, I think it's to do with this ego thing. That my ego rebuilds on anything. My ego attaches itself to anything. And will take me to that certain place unless I'm spiritually fit. And the answer is, I believe in here. Nowhere else. I try all the other stuff. I believe it's in here. Which is the reason why I'm an enthusiast about this book. Uh, I'm not a big book thumper. I'm an enthusiast. There's some folks out there who call me nasty names. I've cleared rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. They've all walked out. Now that's a very strange thing because we're all supposed to be buddies in here. We're all supposed to love you till you can love yourself. They actually said that in that meeting and when I started to share about the big book they all walked out. (laughs) Demonstration of love, folks. I have a great privilege to be here and I, I've got to say I've got to say thank you to the folks that have invited us I haven't done that yet I really need to this is a great privilege you know we get a lot of American folks coming over to Europe and telling you telling us how they do it here well we're coming from Europe and we're going to tell you tomorrow how we do it over there with this book that comes from America <laughs> and we're doing, we're, doing, we're, doing, we're doing what we call in England carrying coals to Newcastle <laughs> and we're probably, we're probably preaching to the converted here however however when I study this book and we really read the black parts in this book And if I can take my ego away from what I see in this book, because I don't really read, you know. I I, I sort of interpret. And when you talk to me, I kind of translate. And I don't actually hear what you say exactly the way you say it. I hear it the way I hear it. Because I'm the one that's hearing it. And when I read, I read the black pieces, but I also read the little white stuff in between. And I've learned to read the black part and not the white crap behind. And I started to study this book very closely, and there was stuff in here that they'd rewritten since I read it before. (laughs) And over the last 16 years, I've been reading this book on a regular basis, and they keep on rewriting it. I keep on seeing other pieces. Now, I love The Lord of the Rings, okay? Uh, Not the movie, but the book. And I used to carry the book around with me. I was a good hippie. All us hippies, we all carried this book. Uh, And it's like quite a big book. And I used to carry this around with me, plus about three three tonne of records. I mean, that was everywhere I went, there was this van. 
and I think I've read I think I've read the Lord of the Rings the whole thing from cover to cover about three times okay I don't know how many times I've read this from cover to cover and I never tire of it why? because I believe this is talking to this not this if I can listen with this if I can read with this my heart and not my head because that gets me into trouble that gets me into places where I'm searching for rich women that can keep me for the rest of my life so I don't have to do nothing and I can just uh, great stuff and that take me, takes me to a very bad place where I'm almost drinking it I didn't keep me sober that night something else kept me sober a power greater than me kept me sober I wasn't spiritually fit it says in here that we will be safe and protected if we are spiritually fit I was not spiritually fit that night but I was kept sober I was taken to a place where somebody said to me and it was only in that and, it, and we didn't really do anything but he said to me have you worked to rework the steps or maybe you should rework the steps I got home to Joseph with one eye and I found my old tapes of Joe and Charlie. They were in a shoebox somewhere hidden. I happened to find a little cassette player. I was able to listen. I had a big book. I was able to listen. I have been, I have been taken to a, an amazing things and places. My grand sponsor now was sponsored by Joe McQueen. Now how about that? I didn't know that. When, when, I, when I approached my sponsor when I met him in the UK and I approached my sponsor I didn't know that his sponsor had been sponsored by Joe McQueen who 12 stepped me from the grave almost, not quite but almost on a tape that had been recorded maybe 15-20 years before and they were pointing me to this book, it wasn't what they said it was what was in here that told me what to do that got me to a place where I had a new spiritual experience what we're going to do very quickly before Jeff pulls the plug on me, very quickly what we're going to do tomorrow is we are going to attempt right? it's going to be an attempt to go through all 12 steps we're not going to read them exactly as they are we're going to pick the bits out but we're going to tell you our experience of working these things. We're very small where we are. We don't have, we don't have big meetings where we are. We, we've probably been running for about, in my little place, we've probably been running for about nine years now. And, and on any night when we have a big book study, there's eight of us. However, we started to count the number of people that have come through our meeting and gone away someplace else because we've got people coming and going and there's many more than that and, and the influence of our little group is very wide I've got the great honour of doing a big book study on Skype and some nights on Skype we, we circle the earth pretty much it's an amazing thing we've got people up in, we've got people up in from Alaska to via South Africa to Australia we've got north and south we've got folks up in, in Norway we've got folks up in Sweden we've got people in the UK it's an amazing thing and the book says I'll finish on this the book says that right in the last chapter it says th- th- two, threes and fives of us is springing up and I think that's what's happening with this that there's two, threes and fives of us enthusiasts for the big book because we know this works we know that if we follow these directions something happens to us that makes us immune to alcohol as long as we continue to stay on the path the path seems to get narrower as we, the more we do it and it dawned on me the other day it's like climbing up a mountain when you get to the, the bottom of the mountain the road is very wide up the valley and you're going up towards the mountain and the road as you go up the mountain the road gets narrower and narrower and narrower and the further up the mountain you go the track gets really narrow but you know what the view gets better huh the view gets better out of the valley you can't see much but when you're up on the mountain you can see an awful lot and I love what this book produces in me 
but more so I love what it produces in other people you know the one of the most amazing things is to see the lights come on with someone that you've just shown how to do this and they've got in touch with their power it's nothing to do with me it's got in touch with their power and their power is switched on the lights there's nothing like that that's the greatest thing in the world you know and, for the, and, and I still carry this, you see. I am responsible. But when, they, when, when it says the hand of AA, Alcoholics Anonymous is named after this book. This book was published six months before there was a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. The first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that we know of was in Cleveland. They said, we're leaving the Oxford group we're Catholics, we can't be members of the Oxford group, Protestant organisation, what should we call ourselves? We'll name ourselves after the book. Okay. The hand of this book, not necessarily the meetings, just one thing. I've got to say this because I heard it again tonight. Our first tradition, in the short form, which was an edit by an editor of Grapevine magazine to stick it on a window blind okay, to match the 12 steps so that we could have two window blinds in our meeting one with the 12 steps on and one with the 12 traditions it's an edit listen to what it says Step one, uh, tradition one our common welfare comes first personal recovery depends upon a, a unity personal recovery so my recovery depends on all you folks sticking together uh uh doesn't say that in this book my recovery depends on my relationship with my higher power that's what my recovery depends upon not on the unity of Alcoholics Anonymous I love the idea of unity of Alcoholics Anonymous but what's it say in the long form in the long form it says each member of Alcoholics Anonymous is but a small part of a great whole AA must continue to live or most of us will surely die I think they're talking about the book I think they're talking about the book living how does the book live? we work what is in the book when traditions were written they were assuming that everybody in Alcoholics Anonymous was working out of this book hence our common welfare comes first the common welfare of each of the groups that's why when you come to my group if you don't do what we do we say maybe you need to go to a different group because everybody that comes to our group we work the steps as they are in this book and we would expect you to work the steps as you've come to our group we want you to work the steps the same as we do because if we start to get outnumbered by the people who are not working the steps in our group our group starts to get watered down and we start to end up being a discussion group and we don't want to be the discussion group we've had discussion groups we're fed up with them they don't work we want to do this so we ask you, we don't ask you to leave we just suggest you might want to either do what we do or find another group people don't like that you know. but it says <laughs> but it says but it says but individual welfare follows it close afterwards so we will help you find another group she'll put the cat among the pigeons when the recording comes out right <laughs> I've got to shut up because otherwise I'm. Really <laughs> I really hope I really hope we can we can have fun tomorrow with this. Um, it's it's really it's we are funny people. Okay, we are funny. So uh, <laughs> we really are. I mean, funny peculiar and funny funny. You know, but funny peculiar. I'm funny peculiar. Um, <laughs> but I hope we can have fun with this tomorrow and that we can zoom through but any kind of schedule that you've seen or whatever, I'll guarantee you we won't stick to it <laughs> how, 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 long, how long have we got to break? Uh, yeah. we've got, well, like now we've probably got about 10 minutes and 15 seconds or something yeah, <laughs> <a bit>. <laughs> <laughs> ok, thank you thank you
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.